<sighs> it's a load of bollocks. That's all, folks. Okay, okay, it's not that simple. Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, and MBs, to Worried Esho. I'm Shaden, resident glutton for punishment and man with rocks for a brain. So, Shield Hero. It seems these days there's always one anime that slots itself into the controversy of the season on Crunchyroll, like there's some kind of industry-wide mandate in Japan to do so, and this time around Shield Hero fits that bill. Produced by Kinema Citrus with financing from Crunchyroll itself, at first if I'm not mistaken, Shield Hero originates from the light novel of the same name written by Anako Yusagi. It features both false rape convictions and slavery as plot points within its opening episodes, which I assume Yusagi-san decides to throw in early, in the same way that someone throws kimchi on their cornflakes for breakfast. The thing about Shield Hero is that in the run-up to its release in January of 2019 and since then, talk of it has permeated my periphery, so to speak, on social media. I kept seeing people mention it in a hugely negative light on how it promotes slavery and has a vile, hateful attitude towards everyone and everything. In turn, I kept seeing an aggressively militant attitude in a select few people rushing to defend it, even co-opting the title and blending it with Gamergate language during the recent Vic Mignoga fracas, believe it or not, as a means of harassing and demeaning his accusers. Try as I might to ignore it, like a billowing smoke cloud on the horizon that persists indefinitely, I couldn't, and after a couple of incidents involving people messaging me directly on Twitter in response to my own light jabs at the show's expense, I decided to harness my inner three-year-old and stick my fingers into the electrical outlet that is watching this show from start to end. Having watched the entire show, the reason I decided to talk about the rising of the shield hero in this long, tortured, sleep-aid commodio essay is it feels emblematic of being poorly written and poorly thought out, serving more as a stream of consciousness than a coherent story, but that it also serves as an object lesson on how it's not simply that the act of writing about topics like slavery, abuse, or rape is wrong, but it's a question of what you choose to do with such topics as a writer that's important. So, strap yourselves in, grab a beer, grab a piece of kebab, and please try me nice my DMs, please? Okay? Cool. Let's get started. Chapter 1. The Praising of the Shield Hero Briefly. I'm going to start with a cold hard fact for you all. It's very rare for any given piece of fiction to be so shit that it has absolutely no redeemable qualities or moments to it. If you've been a long time follower of Warrior Death Show, you'll know we've covered a load of terrible shows out of a sense of group masochism or just plain stupidity. Elfin Lead, Phantom, Redundancy of the Phantom, Darling in the Franks, all of these shows, as bad as they are, do have moments that I think are good or even great. So, credit where it's due, Shield Hero does have some good moments, and in the spirit of fair play, I'll go through them now in no particular order. It won't take long. Number one, the Iron Maiden attack that now Fumi unlocks at the midpoint of the season is metal as fuck, and it's pretty awesome. Number two, during the incident involving the plague caused by the zombie dragon, the colour palette fades a bit and the screen gets just a little bit fuzzy, which does help to visually sell the fact that the area is contaminated. 3. When the Pope, aka the Pontiflex, is about to drop a Wrath of God spell on now Fumi and company later in the season, the music and environmental sounds stop dead and go silent, which works well to build up tension for the coming Orbital Death Ray. And fourth, and finally, Jet Blacksmith. There is another point regarding now Fumi's anger, which is in the show's favour, sort of, but that deserves its own section. So, yeah, that's about it. Sorry. Chapter 2. Isekai for an Eye So what is Isekai? Well, if Wikipedia is to be believed, dicey as that sounds, it's essentially a kind of Japanese fiction which involves an ordinary person being transported from our world, or an approximation thereof, to some other fantastical parallel dimension or land. This other world can be fantasy or sci-fi, past, present, or future. There aren't really any guidelines as to what this new land can be. It could even be a virtual environment, or the protagonist could be killed in real life, with that serving as the conduit to them travelling to this new world. The hard and fast rule is that you take some random dog or dogs from reality, quote-unquote, and drop them in an unusual place far from home. 
thus confirming the Book of Genesis as possibly the earliest example of this. Fiction, on a fundamental level, is appealing to us because it provides a door to escapism. It stimulates our imaginations and widens our worldviews, opens us up to new ideas and possibilities. Isekai, the premise of an ordinary person literally being transported to another world with all its wonders and perils, is therefore unsurprisingly very popular. Unlike a self-contained work of fiction where the walls between real life and elsewhere are insurmountable and impregnable, Isekai tantalises the audience by suggesting subtly that if the protagonists of its works can be whisked away on an adventure from their boring-as-fuck, monotonous lives, you can too, potentially. It's a false promise, for sure, but it's also true to say that even within the confines of reality as we know it, there's always the potential for people to change their lot in life into something more exciting. One of the most popular isekai shows of the past few years, ReZero, is a solid example of how this works in practice, as Subaru is initially excited with the prospects of exploring the strange new world he finds himself in, at least until he realises his spirit animal is the lemming and dies horribly multiple times. Even a shitty isekai like Dog Days does this, as its main character is a parkour expert and he's bored that he can't properly utilise his skills in the real world. In Shield Hero's case, now Fumi has no motivation or desire to leave his current life for anywhere else, stating that he leads a, and I quote, idyllic otaku lifestyle. This is not an inherently bad thing on paper by itself, but the issue with Shield Hero's introduction to Now Fumi before he gets whisked away is that it's kind of pointless. So, let's take a list. What actually happens in the time before Now Fumi reads the book about the four cardinal heroes and gets quantum leaped into the world of Shield Hero? Well, we learn that he once saved his brother for some trouble, for which his parents reward him with an apartment and an allowance, and that now Fumi describes a fairly plain picture of a lady in a robe as slutty. The former doesn't really matter, as we never meet his brother or even get his name, nor is it referenced later in the show, and the latter makes now Fumi look like a dickhead. Not exactly a great start. The thing that perplexes me about this opening is that you could cut now Fumi's real-world introduction from the show without any real consequence for the plot. He, in theory, could just be some villager or random in the alternate world of S.H.I.E.L.D. hero, and the story would lose nothing except the incredibly undercut closing moments where he half decides to stick around to save the world he's caught in. This wouldn't be a massive problem on its own, but there are elements of the story that just won't work or would be made relevant by actually making the time spent with Naofumi in the real world mean a damn. All of the isekai specific elements, including Naofumi's origin point as an otaku, are only present in the show in the service of being relatable to the target audience in a blunt force trauma kind of way. Speaking of which... Chapter 3. Shield Hero Thinks You Suck. I'll give the show a fair shake here and say that I don't think it intends to think of its target audience as pawn life, and nor do I to be fair as long as you're not using the show as a springboard to harass people, but it has to be said, there's a lot to be read into when it comes to what Shield Hero thinks of Otaku. Let's start with Naofumi. He buys and own Raftalia as Philo as slaves, the former of which he uses as a child soldier in episode 2. In buying Raftalia and Philo, he later perpetuates that same slave trade. He says in the second episode that slaves aren't people. And in general, when he's travelling the world throughout the show, he demands payment at every opportunity for food, supplies, and other medical items, even from people who are sick and or starving. In the battle of the Pope later on in the show's run, he decides to take the opportunity to dunk on the other heroes for their own unique brand's idiocy, which, whether or not you agree with him doing it at all, is extremely ill-timed, given that that Pope is about to drop another wrath of God on them. This argument, by the way, also shows now Fumi's word is meaningless, given he promised the, the filial queen to try and work with the other heroes, a promise which, if broken, actually means his death as well as that of his companions. Meanwhile, Ren, the sword hero, causes a plague by slaying a dragon that then decays on the hillside, leading to the village below falling sick. While Ren didn't know that this would happen, you don't really get off the hook for being ignorant in my opinion. Ren also says that because slavery is legal in this world, it's fine, which I'll cover in more detail later, but for now I'll sell by saying he's an idiot. Itsuki, the bow hero, also triggers a regime change in a different country which leads to an as shitty if not more shitty dictator taking over after he leaves. Again, he didn't know. And again, nice one dipshit. That just leaves Motoyasu, the spear hero, a character whose head is completely empty save for two mothballs and possibly a stick insects. 
Motoyasu is now Fumi's rival of sorts, and his crimes include nearly destroying a village through planting a magical tree that nearly overruns the place, being so dense that he can't see past Mine's various paper-thin lies, and paedophilic dog whistling with his attraction to Philo along with trying to shackle her. The one redeeming thing he does in the entire show is where he rightly points out that slavery is terrible, but again, I'll cover that later. Overall, Motoyasu is a waste of oxygen. With the exception of Naofumi, the show frames the heroes as awful, useless people. At least, that's what it intends. And it's why I don't think the writers wanted it to come across that otaku, as far as S.H.I.E.L.D. heroes concerned, are all mouth-breathing idiots. But it's really not helped by the fact that the protagonist's own laundry list of awful behaviour is actually longer than at least Ren and Itsuki's combined. Were this intentional, with some rewrites here and there, it'd actually make for an incendiary and interesting takedown of isekai protagonists set loose in another world, but ReZero this ain't, I'm afraid, and it only gets worse. In the world of Shield Hero, everyone is subject to a video game-like set of mechanics that determine their abilities, their strengths, and their weaknesses. This even goes so far as to manifest in terms like hit points, levels, SP, and so on. It is, for all intents and purposes, the system of any average JRPG. Like everything else in fiction, the act of simply having a JRPG-like system that influences and controls both battles and character behaviour and motivations isn't in a vacuum a bad thing. The question a writer has to ask though is why they are choosing to put this system into something that isn't a video game or akin to noted isekai anime iconoclast Sword Art Online, where the setting is explicitly a digital world. So that leads us to ask, why is there a JRPG system for levels and stats in Shield Hero insofar as the story is concerned? Well, if you're playing along at home and know the actual answer as opposed to the fear I have, please write in because I would love to know. Now Fumi, after all, is transported into the world of Shield Hero via a book. Not a computer, not a smartphone, not a previously unplugged arcade machine, but a book. He is not, as the show presents it, in a virtual video game environment. So why is this system here? If you want to read it this way, this is another piece of evidence that the author doesn't care for otaku, because this system serves as a poor substitute for conveying meaning and impacts in fights, and also for character motivations. Now Fumi wants to get stronger, get more money, and obtain new gear, not since because he wants to fight the waves of catastrophe, but because those are the highlights of playing an RPG. Characters are gated behind level caps and class upgrades because that's what happens in an RPG. The threat of the waves is mostly expressed in terms of the levels of the monsters that spawn from them, not the devastation they can cause to the lives and the livelihoods of the con people of Shield Hero. This is quantitative storytelling. It's all about the numbers, how many hit points you have, your DPS, the number of materials required to craft an item, and so on. For Shield Hero, it is rarely, if ever, about why this matters, in a way beyond one side having bigger numbers than the other. And depending on how you slice it, the author either didn't know how to tell this story without relying on the crutch of integrating a JRPG system into it to explain what's going on and why one fight is more difficult than the other, or that they deliberately chose this because JRPG video games are likely what otaku are familiar with and that they don't respect otaku to try and engage with the story qualitatively, i.e. with its meaning. After all, why else have the barbarian armor get a nameplate appearance when now Fumi first wears it, and not for any of the characters? The answer is simple, because it's a piece of loot, and in a role-playing game, the loot comes first as a reward for playing and all else is secondary. This, and not the actual story, is what's important in Shield Hero, and by focusing on these elements above all else, it betrays a lack of trust in the target audience to engage with the plot and its meaning beyond, well, anything other than plus five to strength and a chance to trigger a free fucking heal when being hit. Chapter 4. How not to make waves. When it comes to stories, there are two levels on which they operate, macro and micro. Macro is the big picture, what's going on in the wider world. Micro is per character or per group, low level, as if viewed under a microscope. If we take, say, The Lord of the Rings as an example, the macro level plot is the discovery of the One Ring and the quest to destroy it to prevent evil from devouring all of Middle Earth. On a micro level, it's about Frodo's struggle to not be consumed by the Ring, lest he turn into what you'd get if you put the soul of a magpie into an embalmed corpse and brought it back to life. As it was in Lord of the Rings, the macro-micro layers of a story weave together and interact. 
After all, Frodo's struggle to resist the One Ring wouldn't have happened had the need to destroy it not been thrust upon him, and in turn that struggle to prevent his descent into madness threatens the very objective of destroying it in the first place. These driving forces are interlinked, and in the case of Lord of the Rings, in a good way. Shield Hero is not so fortunate, and its macro and micro actively work against each other before driving off a cliff and onto jagged rocks, and then exploding violently. For context, where Lord of the Rings had Sauron, Shield Hero has the waves of catastrophe. These are periodic events which cause the skies to turn blood red and portals to open that unleash torrents of monsters on the land. The waves can only be stopped by killing their associated boss monster, and they are, in the context of Shield Hero at least, analogous to a world ending event like a meteor impact, the sun going supernova, or your local town being visited by Ed Sheeran. Except, they aren't. They really fucking aren't. At least, they are not portrayed credibly enough to be taken seriously. The opening episodes of Shield Hero establish the waves to Naofumi and Co, and note that the first has already hit and already been dealt with. While this mildly dilutes their threat that the heroes were not required to beat that particular wave, this isn't a deal breaker, but what is, is what was shown of the capital city of Melonmark in the early episodes, right after the first wave. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. The city is going about its business as usual, and had I not been told the wave had hit before the heroes had arrived, I would have believed nothing had happened. This is the same issue, by the way, that Red Letter Media mentioned in their Plinkett review of Star Wars Episode 3, UNLIMITED POWER, or as it's known in other countries, Revenge of the Sith, where despite a massive space battle over the Coruscant at the start of the film, throughout the remainder of the runtime, things are fine. People are going into the opera and all that other stuff, as opposed to any sort of actual wartime consequences like food shortages, curfews, or civil unrest. Shield Hero suffers the same problem. As a point of contrast to Shield Hero, let's compare this to Netflix's Castlevania Season 1, which side by side share several surface elements, waves of monsters attacking at periodic intervals, a protagonist disinterest in saving the world around him, and some things to do with video games. Although in Castlevania's case, and to its credit, that video game is the source material, whereas in Shield Hero, it's the storytelling method the author chooses to use that is barely one notch above finger puppets in terms of maturity or complexity, but I digress. In episode 2 of Castlevania Season 1, noted raging alcoholic and vampire slayer Trevor Belmont arrives at the town of Greshit, which is being assaulted nightly by the demonic hordes of Dracula's army. As Trevor makes his way into the barricaded city, we as the audience see the effects of Dracula's assaults on the town quite clearly. People's heads are mounted on pikes, bodies are being buried en masse, children snatched from cribs, the streets soaked with blood, etc etc, your usual night in Liverpool basically. This is solid environmental storytelling though, the threat of Dracula's demons is clearly shown to the audience rather than being explained second hand, and it makes it clear that the town is barely holding itself together and could well end up not surviving another night. Furthermore, we see Trevor's apathy and indifference brought to the fore through his reactions to the same things that we see, which in addition to the scene at the pub earlier in the same episode, helps flesh out his character and the starting point of his journey back to actually being able to give a shit about other people. If all that sounds familiar to you, then that is also Naofumi's character arc. Allegedly. Maybe. Not really. But insofar as the waves are presented in Shield Hero, the series neglects to do what Castlevania did and visually establish the damage they can do and the lasting impacts they have on the common folk at an early point of the show's run. The earliest this really happens is when the first wave hits which now Fumi gets to see first hand, but since the heroes intervene and the wave is stopped early before any major damage occurs, it doesn't serve as an example of what would happen were they to fail or not be there. The only genuine equivalent to the Greshit scenes from Castlevania come after the midpoint of the entire fucking show's run when we get to see what happened to Raftalia's hometown, by which point it is far too late to make the audience take them seriously as a threat, and more importantly, as a motivating factor behind Naofumi's shitty actions. But that's just the audience's perception. What about the characters? After all, it's not enough to have an overarching threat or enemy be presented to the viewer as dangerous. The protagonists and other characters in the plot need to take it seriously as well. You need both to make for an effective plot which has enough tension and drive to keep an audience hooked. So how does Shield Hero handle this? No prizes for guessing it fumbles this too, breaking both its legs in the process. 
I'm going to consciously disregard Ren, Suki, and Mosiasu's views and their handling of the waves, since the show frames each of them as having the mental capacity of a fucking fruit fly. So it makes clear that their inability to take the wave seriously is a bad thing, which is good. But then there's now Fumi and mine, who, as much as the show would like you to think are flawless, virtuous hero, spiteful harpy, respectively, do share one common trait. Their inability to also treat the waves as something worth getting out of bed for in the morning. With regards to mine, I'll be covering her in more detail later, but for now I have one question to ask. If all four heroes are absolutely mandatorily required to stop the waves and save the world, as is explained often in the show's run, why does she screw Naofumi over in the first place? Granted, the necessity of Naofumi's involvement to stop the waves is never concretely established to the audience, another symptom of the show is poor fleshing out of its world and mechanics, but if we take it as true that Naofumi is required, then Mine's actions arguably could have resulted in the end of the world! So whereas I might forgive from a writing perspective that Mine is a vile person because that's just how she is, in a story with far less stakes on a worldwide level, when the Armageddon is imminent, there has to be something provided to explain her actions. Now, I should stress, this doesn't have to be anything remotely justifiable. The audience just needs something to get why Mine might try to do something that would result in the deaths of millions of people. That doesn't seem like that big of an ask, but Shield Hero doesn't have the desire to present Mine as anything other than a wicked temptress, so her actions are just completely baffling. Unless you make a particular reading on her that I'll come back to later. As for now, Fumi, I've already mentioned a few ways in which his actions make him as much of a bell end as Mosiasu and the others, but I'll close out the issue of the ways with a moment from much later in the show that is still consistent with how he is portrayed. So while levelling in a bonus XP area on an island, yes, really, Raftalia comments to now Fumi that another wave might be imminent. Now Fumi's response? Well, we probably have time as if you were trying to catch a fucking train. That's what the protagonist of the show, the one it frames as knowing best, and who berates the other heroes constantly for taking things too casually, that's what he thinks of the apocalyptic threat that they face. And the best part is that the legendary weapons like the shield that the heroes have can connect to the dragon hourglasses in each city to give them a timer of when the next wave is going to hit. In the episode previous to the one where Naofumi makes that boneheaded comment, he visited one such dragon hourglass. Did he take the time to obtain the countdown until the next wave? Of course he fucking didn't. He only finds out later when he discovers another hourglass in an underwater ruin by complete chance, which is about as transparent as the show gets to showing how little the author cared for the waves of catastrophe as a plot device or as a threat. Hell, speaking for myself here, between the story threads of the waves and now Fumi finally clearing his name after the false conviction due to mine, the latter... At episode 21 of 25 is arguably when the story ends, which is about as damning an indictment as you can get about how piss poorly this show handles its macro plotting. All in all, the show's approach to the waves of catastrophe is, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Which makes for a great REM song, but not for an isekai plot. And this has consequences that feed into the rest of the show's elements, which leads us nicely on to... Chapter 5. Slavery is bad. Yep, there's no but here. I really shouldn't have to state this, but so it's absolutely clear, slavery is wrong. It's wrong in whatever context it happens in, and regardless of how it is executed. If you have a person own someone as a slave, and at the same time have them have custody of someone else, and these two individuals are treated exactly the same, then it is still wrong. It's not just a question of how you treat someone, but that you place yourself above them by labelling them as property, no different than a household appliance or a pet. This should be about as obvious as saying that water is wet, but if the internet has taught me anything, it's that there'll be someone out there who says that fire isn't hot, and will do so in a Twitter thread longer than the exasperated sigh I'll let loose while reading it. Does this mean you should never write a story about slavery or one that involves it as a subject matter? Of course not. This goes as well for any other topic that might be considered taboo, such as child abuse, racism, genocide, fascism, and all those other wonderful things that fill out the EDL standard issue bingo card. The question is what you choose to do with it, and whether or not your work overtly or tacitly endorses these morally repugnant things. 
a work might state at the outset that it doesn't reflect the author's views or perspectives, but that's a legal defense at most. Works of fiction don't form in vacuums or are extracted from the earth like some kind of rare mineral, but they are instead usually carefully crafted by human hands, and that can leave the author's fingerprints all over it. Shield Hero has been called out before for being slavery apologia, and I should note here that this isn't the same thing as saying that slavery was okay, quote-unquote, in a very specific circumstance in the show, but rather that Shield Hero is cool with slavery as a broad principle. The issue is that Shield Hero rarely ever examines its own use of slavery as a narrative element, or even plain just mentions it. For vast swathes of the show's runtime, the fact, for example, that Raftalia is a slave and that in turn is never brought up, has led some people commenting that that means it doesn't matter. Which I should point out is not a defence of the show, but instead a criticism. If it's so irrelevant after all, why is it in there? Did the author of Shield Hero finish the sentence Raftalia is an X or blank with a smartphone's autocomplete? But anyways... With regards to being slavery apologia, there is one scene I can point to where this is very apparent, and it involves everyone's favourite window licker, Motoyasu. This is in episode 4, where after Naofumi loses to Motoyasu in a duel, thanks to some skullduggery from Mine and Company, Raftalia's slave brand is removed by the villains to punish Naofumi, which is an incredible narrated pretzel that tries to make this act of emancipation seem equivalent to, I don't know, stealing Naofumi's bank card or setting his car on fire. Later, Ren comments that because slavery is legal in Melonmark, therefore it's fine. Motiasu protests against this, but because he, even this early in the show, has been painted as having a hamster pulling several levers in his skull, as opposed to an actual brain, the show frames his perspective as being invalid by associating these two things. Indeed, in the scene where this happens, no one supports him or backs him up at all. He is stood in the middle of the hall where this takes place, looking like he's walked in with no pants on. This right here is the slavery apology element of the show. Framing Motoyasu as the colossal idiot he is is one thing, but then using that framing as juxtaposition against the very correct viewpoint that slavery is wrong in order to dismiss it outright is incredibly fucking scummy. As regards to Ren's view that slavery is legal and therefore it's good, Laws as we know them have often not aligned with morality or ethics, nor are they even universal across countries, and they change over time too, such as the actual slave trade in the United States or in the British Empire eventually both being outlawed at various points in history. But hey, don't take it from just me, there are plenty of anime out there that show that even legal processes and activities aren't automatically sacrosanct. Anime such as, oh, I don't know, this is, this is difficult. Oh yeah, the rising of the shield hero. After all, Naofumi was falsely convicted of raping mine in the first episode, yet the process that led to that was a legal one, including the presenting of evidence to the king of Melonmark. Now don't get me wrong here, what happened to Naofumi was wretched. But the show can't have its cake and eat it by adopting the Judge Dredd approach that the law is always right and ergo slavery is dandy, and then portray his false conviction as well as a travesty at the same fucking time. So the show is openly apologetic to slavery in general, but what about how it handles now Fumi's decision to buy a slave in the first place? After all, there's nothing wrong, narratively speaking, with having a protagonist do terrible things if we can understand how they came to make that decision, and then if the show doesn't endorse the acts in a vacuum. Shield Hero has already face-planted on the latter deliberately, but it can't even do the former the barest justice. At the time now Fumi buys Raftalia, he is neither starving, destitute, or about to die of thirst. He is self-sufficient on funds made from gathering herbs and materials from outside of town, his reasoning is that as the shield hero, he lacks the offensive capability to level up any further since he cannot tackle tougher monsters, which is an astoundingly flimsy and pathetic reason to go from naught to slave master in the all of two minutes it takes now for me to do so. This is why I discussed the failure of shield hero to make the waves of catastrophe a credible threat earlier, because they are supposedly the pressure that is exerted on now for me to do what he does but he only ever considers them a real worry when taking a moment to dunk on the other heroes, not really in private or otherwise. 
and the time he buys Raftalia, now Fumi expresses little if no concern publicly or privately that he isn't ready for the upcoming wave. In fact, he so casually makes the purchase from the slave owner, a man who looks like a cross between Dick Dastardly and the Go Compare mascot, that you'd think he was putting a Tesco meal deal through the self-service checkout. One storytelling device that Shield Hero utilises that you'll doubtless have encountered before is the inner voice. This is when a character alternates between talking to someone else in the show, or the fictive world, to themselves, which sort of serves as a kind of fourth wall break, since only the audience gets to hear it. For example, I can tell you that Shield Hero is an isekai, and I think it's a load of old bollocks. In the show, now Fumi is the one that often delivers these inner voice lines, and they never feel compelling or convincing in relaying the pressure he is under to do the shitty things he does. They, like much else in the show, both in terms of its construction and its characters, are delivered with all the conviction of a high school student trying to explain why they haven't brought their fucking homework in. And then there's the question of how now Fumi treats Raftalia. If you need a quick summation of his method of looking after her, it is entirely materialistic. He buys her a ball but doesn't play with her. His interest in her welfare starts and ends with what he can buy to keep her happy, as opposed to caring about her as a person. If you need any evidence of this, consider what happens at the end of episode 2. What happens is that now Fumi takes Raftalia with him to an abandoned mine to collect ore to sell for profit. He is warned in advance that the mine was abandoned due to it being infested by dangerous monsters, and in the process of exploring the mine, he and Raftalia are attacked by a powerful Cerberus-like creature. This forces now Fumi to in turn force Raftalia to fight it off, despite the fact she's barely 8 years old at this point and still traumatised by what happened to her parents. Conceivably, she and now Fumi both could have been fucking killed. The only reason they ended up in that situation was because now Fumi ignored the warnings of the villager mentioned before and all to collect ore for profit, which he never expresses as being in such desperate need of to fight the waves. So if you're keeping score, in short, he almost got Raftalia killed out of greed and in doing so turned it into a child soldier against her will, which does make me wonder if Hideo Kojima was the ghostwriter behind this episode. Nonetheless, the optics of this are atrocious. This entire plot thread could have been rewritten to simply have Naofumi and Raftalia ambushed in the wild by a similarly powerful monster, and this would have had the effect of making him both look less like a colossal twat and also not having the self-preservation talent of one of the Three Stooges. And finally, in this cornucopia of terrible, there's what happens after Raftalia's slave brand is removed following the duel with Motoyasu. Raftalia at this point decides to have the brand reapplied of her own volition. She tells Naofumi that she's doing this as a sign of his faith in her, which, given the slave brands in Shield Hero prevent the slave from betraying their master, seems kind of counterintuitive. But the real reason this is happening is because it takes the responsibility of Naofumi forcing the brand back onto her out of his hands. After all, if he did that, he would, rightly, come across as a massive bellend. So the show ducks that by having Raftalia do it herself. Yet by doing this, the show again also similarly shoots itself in the foot, because having previously established slavery as all well and good for its pillaring of Mosiasu, it now contradicts itself by taking the acts of having Raftalia rebranded out of Naofumi's hands. In the show's battle between being cool with slavery and never making Naofumi look bad, the former loses. But on the overall scoreboard for both, Shield Hero is still Slavery Apologia, and Naofumi is still a complete cock, so... Lose-lose, I guess. So yes, Shield Hero handles slavery with the tact and grace of a drunk Mancunian riding a unicycle. But at least it doesn't also attempt to tackle other sensitive topics like racism, right? Right? Oh, dicks. Chapter 6. Raftalia and Diet Racism If there's one thing I'm beginning to despise more and more in anime and in other media, it's the inclusion of beast men and using how they are treated as an allegory for racism. Not because of the principle or the idea of doing so, much like everything else I've discussed before, but because of how, more often than not, the inclusion of humanoid characters with animalistic design traits is entirely for aesthetics, or, to put it in layman's terms, shows that do this make a piss-poor job of actually exploring and criticising racism. Shield Hero is, shock of all shocks, guilty of this too, although I do think, to its credit, it does a better job of handling the racism element than Rooster Teeth's magnum opus, Ruby, in which for the first three seasons, the racism the Fornance experience exists entirely in Blake's anecdotal flashbacks and never in reality. 
And while I'm not one to excuse ignorance or inability to pass and criticise racism because of the culture or country you come from, the Ruby was produced in America, which hadn't outlawed segregation until the 1960s and decided that its treatment of racism should be so extensive as to barely fit on a bar mat is astonishing in its shittiness. But that's a podcast for another time. It's established early in S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero that Mel and Mark practices what is described as human supremacy. This is what allows the dick dastardly slave owner to operate openly in the city. And to S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero's mild credit, it does touch on this more than Ruby did, which, scientifically speaking, was somewhere between fuck and all. Now, Fumi visits a pub, for example, that says no non-humans allowed outside. And shortly after he buys Raftalia, we do witness another slave owner with two Beastman child slaves carrying his luggage through town. For the first half of the season, though, that's it. Yep, really. S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero even cocks this up with some contradictory behaviour that shows Raftalia's inclusion in the show for what it is, aesthetics, as she is given a treat by a couple in the street who comment on how cute she is. While I, of course, can believe that there would be people in Mel and Mark who wouldn't ascribe to the human supremacy idea, or go around wearing S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero's equivalent of albino Pac-Man cosplay, it's emblematic of the show's general approach to anything it chooses to tackle, half arsing it. There are so few moments in the first half of the show's run that cover or mention Mel and Mark's human supremacy policy that the times it does become more noticeable, so contradicting the fact that the Go Compare Slave Master can operate freely in the city and people are just okay with that, with Raftalia getting a treat from a random couple, just makes Shield Hero come across like it was written after the author ran into a lamppost by accident. The larger issue, though, is that government-sanctioned racism is systemic and therefore needs to be portrayed and examined as such, which doesn't happen, as those moments I mentioned before are the sum total of the first half of the show's examination and critique of Mel and Mark's human supremacy. This is further muddied by the fact that as Naofumi's companion, the grief that Raftalia receives is mostly because of that association, rather than just because she is a demi-human. The second half of the show introduces Raftalia's village and her friends from her youth, elements that are so vital to her character that it takes that long for them to become relevant. This also introduces a Baron who previously had incarcerated Raftalia and her friends, and is somewhere between the raccoon Cyril Sneer and the Simpsons' Mr. Burns insofar as how cartoonishly villainous he is. And while I do appreciate that at least the show includes one government official who depicts that racist policy, he is also just one baron of one territory around Melonmark, and is so cartoonish that it doesn't really give S.H.I.E.L.D. Heroes' tackling of racism genuine weight. But it gets worse because of how, once again, S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero contradicts itself through its refusal to make Naofumi look bad in any way. After Mine's Just Desserts are delivered in episode 21, Melty, her younger sister and first in line to the throne of Melonmark, tells Raftalia that she will work on improving the lives of the demi-humans in the country, which implies the end of the human supremacy policy. This, I should make clear, is a very good thing. However, bear in mind that Melty is telling this to Raftalia, who is now Fumi's slave. Melty makes no mention of this, or explicitly of outlawing slavery, because that would then bring into focus that now Fumi is no better than the Baron I mentioned earlier. And that's a line S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero will not cross, so Melty's proclamation that she will work to make the lives of Raftalia's kin better is as hollow and empty as the cavity between Mosayasu's ears. Moving away from the diet racism of S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero, there are two final things I want to know about Raftalia before we move on. Firstly, for those who've not seen the show in full but have seen both Raftalia as a child and then as an adult, you might wonder about the time span it takes place in, if you guessed a decade or more to allow her to age from, say, 8 to 18, then congratulations, you are dead wrong. But you're also far more rational than S.H.I.E.L.D. heroes, Arthur. You see, demi-humans in the world of S.H.I.E.L.D. hero age normally, but can also have their growth accelerated by levelling up. Yes, levelling up. This happens off-screen between episodes 2 and 3 of the show's run, which if you're keeping score means Raftalia was barely present as a child, to the point I would argue you could excise her being first introduced as A entirely, without consequence, instead having a be adult age from the moment Naofumi meets her. Secondly, Raftalia eventually develops the hots for Naofumi, which is hilarious considering the only thing it seems he'll ever want to fuck is his PC's USB port, and of course he'll put his penis in the wrong way up. However, this then takes on a creepy side when you consider that, 
of course, now for whom he owns her as a slave, and secondly, that he arguably raised her as an adoptive father too, an angle that I've seen some people use to defend their relationship. I always find this hilarious because given Naofumi used her as a child soldier for his own greedy ends, it suggests that people like me have had an unfulfilled childhood just because my own dad didn't have the good bloody grace to, you know, send me off to war when I was barely old enough to ride the teacups at Disneyland. But I digress. The real point here is that given Raftalia eventually develops feelings for him to the point of wanting to bang him, I mean, why else would she place such emphasis at one point on her being a virgin? This basically makes Naofumi the Woody Allen of anime. Like much else in this show, it can't have things both ways, and short of fetishism and paedophilic dog whistling, I cannot see what would be lost by having Raftalia not being an adult from the get-go, and also not being a slave, and say instead being a mercenary or anything else. After all, as much as you might argue that Naofumi trusts no one and only ever use a slave as a weapon, given what happened with mine, that's just an in-show explanation. The writing can be whatever it needs to be to serve the story, and like all else in S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero, I get the distinct impression that, at best, Raftalia being a child slave was included because the author was clueless on the implications of doing so, or at worst, because they were entirely aware of and fine with it. Either way, it can piss right off. Chapter 7 Mine and the fiction of women ruining absolutely everything. I've already covered Mine's lack of motivation for deciding to screw over Naofumi and potentially cause the end of the world as a result, but let's go outside of the events of the show and talk about Mine's depiction and what you could read it as. When Naofumi arrives in the world of S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero, apart from meeting some snarky criticism from his fellow heroes on the basis that his class is apparently underpowered in video game terms, in the same way that The Sims can teach you how to adequately manage your finances and raise a family, he is initially optimistic and then very smitten with mine when she agrees to accompany him while he levels up. For the record, the show will present Naofumi's naivete and dewy-eyed affection for mine being the one as wrong which is one of the very few sentiments it has that I will agree on. It's not right, or is it reasonable, to have that kind of all-in, she's the one I've been waiting for mindset, as it does women a disservice by implying that they're just objects of pursuit for men. That now Fumi becomes a cold-hearted prick as a result of Mind's actions is understandable in the short term, but not a healthy outlook for his attitude or personality in the long run, but more on that later. What you could read from S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero, and doubtless many have, even if unconsciously, is that Mind's actions have ruined for Naofumi what should have been a glorious experience. An otaku like him, travelling to a fantasy land that works with the rule set of a standard JRPG, finally allowing him to cut loose, show his stuff and bag some great gear in the process? Sounds awesome, right? And then a woman, Mind specifically, comes along and ruins it all for him, leaving him with barely the clothes on his back, no money and dim prospects for his future in this fantasy world. If this sounds familiar to you, then there's your Gamergate connection that I mentioned at the start of the cast, and how women apparently once destroy video games. I personally don't put any stock in that idea and think it's a load of horse shit, but you need to take it from me. Shield Hero, as a show, actively disproves its own thesis of mine and collectively through her, women, ruining things for men, and this has to do with the cesp of Naofumi's origin in the real world and the experiences he brings with it. You see, I mentioned before that Naofumi mentions small parts of his real life, like how he lives the quote-unquote idyllic otaku lifestyle and once helps his brother out of a jam, but what he does not mention, and ergo has not happened, is that in the real world he originates from, he has never had a bad experience with women. Thusly, because the world of S.H.I.E.L.D. hero is fictional, and now for me brings no such experiences with him from the analogue of our real world, it can be understood that S.H.I.E.L.D. hero's portrayal of mine as a conniving temptress is just as fictional. Like a lot of other elements in the show, S.H.I.E.L.D. hero contradicts itself and face plants on this depiction of women as untrustworthy and callous creatures who seek to destroy the wholesome good times that people like Naofumi are having. Again, to reiterate, I do believe that people like mine exist out there in the real world, but that's the distinction I make here, one that S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero doesn't. As much as I don't want to say it, if you think S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero is about sticking a middle finger to women as an amorphous, secret society of supervillains-esque group, it doesn't actually go far enough. I know, right? This is more evidence that cutting out Naofumi's origin point of coming from the real world and changing S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero from an isekai to a straight-up fantasy show would have actually been beneficial to its overall plot and messaging, even if I don't agree with a single bit of it. 
Lastly, let's talk about the very plain and vanilla topics of female sexuality and fan service. Oh boy, this is going to end well, isn't it? Anyway, Mime uses her feminine charms to woo Naofumi into working with her and then keeping him in the dark about her true intentions, conning him out of his money and then, as a result of his false rape conviction, leaving him with barely the clothes on his back, as I mentioned before. This, so it's very clear is vile as far as I'm concerned. No one, regardless of their gender, should use their physical attractiveness and or charisma to do harm to others. And similarly, there is nothing wrong with S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero using a false conviction as a plot point in a vacuum. However, when Mine is eventually put in the stockades and on trial for her crimes against Naofumi, she has a slave brand applied to her as a means of forcing her to tell the truth about what she did. Now, given that the brands actually prevent the slave from betraying their master, this doesn't really, to me at least, make them lie detectors so much as ways of extracting a false confession. But that's a minor quibble, and I'm happy to believe it's the actual truth she is telling here. The issue, however, is how mine is framed during her trial, by which I mean the camera. The slave crest you see is applied around the collarbone area, and the camera and framing during the trial often shows this in close-up along with mine's cleavage. Combined with her being electrocuted when she tries to lie about what happened, you've got a fetishistic recipe of sexualization and punishment. So if you're keeping count, it's not good for a woman to use her sexuality to trick and con men, which I agree with, but also according to Shield Hero, it's fine for a woman to be sexualized when it's for the entertainment and benefit of men, as let's be honest, that's the target audience here. It's astounding that every message the show wants to put out seems to essentially boil down to, this thing is bad, except when we do it and essentially performs the Fimasi equivalent of trying to cartwheel down a flight of stairs. Done correctly, it'd be really impressive, but all the show ends up doing is just breaking every bone in its body. This culminates in Naofumi engaging in another moment where the show tries to slide his shitty behaviour under the radar through trying to use context as a defence. Context which only exists because it was crafted so by the author, and ergo could have been done differently any number of ways. So Mai's trial ends with her being sentenced to death by her mother, the Queen, which S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero has its own problems with fetishising and sexualising to the point where she starts talking out of vagina at various points. No, really, that's how the camera frames it. But anyway, now Phoebe spares mine on the caveat that she must now legally be called bitch and slut going forward. I'll just let that sink in for a moment. It is an act of mercy, to be certain. But this is just a smokescreen to have him engage in the kind of juvenile bullshit you'd expect from a prepubescent Fortnite player. Furthermore, this action does not sanction her from interfering with Naofumi later, such as when she tries to poison his food. Mine absolutely deserves to be punished for her actions, no question about that. But just like with Naofumi's dunking on Mosiyasu and company during the fight with the Pope, it only serves to make him look both like an arsehole and an idiot. Simply locking her up for life would have sufficed and been more effective, or any number of other solutions that could have been written in place of what we got. But this is just crass and pathetic. All in all, mine is no more a character than everyone else in the show apart from Naofumi, because they are all, without exception, crafted to make him look good, either through direct praise or subservience, as with Raftalia, or because of their idiocy or connivory, as with mine. That is the only reason she exists in the story, and whatever the message, whatever the angle, if you encounter characters like her in fiction, I would suggest we all take five minutes just to interrogate their inclusion and why they're there. Although honestly, I think the most likely explanation for mine is that S.H.I.E.L.D. Heroes author made her by accident when they wrote in the work in progress manuscript for the story instead of posting a new status to Facebook. Chapter 8 Rage Quit so I mentioned back at the beginning of this oral nightmare that there was an element of the show that I appreciated, which was its presentation of Naofumi's anger. In the spirit of honesty and putting all my cards on the table, seeing Naofumi punching the floor in the closing third of episode 4 and his fury at how people were dumping on him for no reason, I did feel sympathy for him then, because I've been there myself. Not in a fantasy world with a shield that looks like a stolen protective underplate from a Tesla, but in real life. I've had numerous bad experiences with individuals, women included, and I'd come to the point where I found myself incapable of trusting people to even do basic things for me. I eventually went to therapy and things are much better now. But I won't deny feeling how now Fumi felt, and similarly, I won't deny your feelings if you felt the same. There are plenty of people out there, young men in particular I'd wager, who've been in that place of anger and hatred. It similarly wouldn't surprise me people had been drawn to the show because of that, 
After all, simply acknowledging that your anger is legitimate is a powerful feeling, especially from a piece of media. There are differences, however, between experiencing a feeling, interpreting it, and then dealing with it. For now, Fumi, his answer is to demand payment or hard commitments, such as the slave crest, from the people he works with, always operating on a level of distrust. He remains at that nadir throughout the show's run and doesn't really change throughout, not least of which being that he never sets Raftalia free. This is the core of Shield Hero's philosophic response to what mine and the other heroes do to Naofumi, that rather than recognising the callousness of the individuals involved, it instead goes for the broad brush approach where everyone is guilty until proven innocent. The problem is that by acting this way, as my therapist taught me, it's a logical cul-de-sac since you never give people the opportunity to prove their integrity and their capability to you, and therefore you'll never be proven wrong. Now, I'm not saying that Naofumi needs to go to therapy in the show, because that wouldn't exactly make for well-paced, riveting storytelling in the middle of the old, uh, whole apocalypse thing, but there's no reason he couldn't grow as a person and realise the mistakes he's made as a result of his trauma. This, I should add, also doesn't mean that he needs to forgive mine or Mosiasu or any of the others, but there's a lighter touch approach out there that doesn't involve making himself look stupid or pathetic in the process. This is also why, even if you were to argue that your average otaku can and won't buy a slave in real life, the slavery element is still poisonous if taken in as an approach to other people. After all, slavery creates a hierarchy where one person, the master, is placed above others, their slaves. This legitimization of a hierarchy based on the devaluing of other people is what the show promotes by not challenging or critiquing Naofumi's actions, leading to the overall message that just like Naofumi, if people got out of your way or fell in line, things would, you know, actually get done. I would engage in such lunacy as to say Shield Hero would directly inspire someone to go and actually buy another person as property, much as the same I wouldn't say, for example, that Doom directly inspires people to go out on a murder spree. But I do think that consuming media along these lines, and a lot of it, does ultimately lead to an approval of that perspective where everyone else is shit and you aren't. There's also a chicken and egg thing when it comes to stories like this that approve of any ideology, whatever, you know, that may be. Do people consume ideological fiction because it reinforces and agrees with their pre-existing worldview, or because it opens the door to such a line of thinking that they never knew of? This is also why, for all the pointless arguments about Aniko Yusagi being a woman or not don't really matter, whatever their intent was in creating Shield Hero, and whether or not the finished product is venomous propaganda or just a deeply uncooked and ill-thought-out piece of shit, it found many audiences and became popular. For some viewers, they will have enjoyed it simply as a fantasy story. For others, such as those I mentioned using hashtag not your shield hero, it approved of their pre-existing worldview. As such, all I can suggest as before is a sense of caution when looking at works like Shield Hero. If you can watch it and enjoy it without subscribing to its worldview and ideology, then that's great, that's awesome, and I'm glad for you. But as someone who's been in the depths of vitriolic loathing as now Fumi has, I can tell you from first-hand experience that wallowing in that only means you'll end up treating other people like dirt, or potentially bringing yourself to serious, actual harm. Be glad that a show like this can exist that recognises your anger and accept the feeling as legitimate, but be very suspicious of any interpretation of that anger that the show might offer you. Chapter 9. That's all, folks. There is so so much more I could discuss, such as, say, Philo's own character focus episodes having all the payoff of a Kinder Egg filled with lint and soot, or, for example, Glass being treated as flimsily as the waves in terms of being a genuine threat that Naofumi actually takes seriously, and the barely existent afterthought of a backstory that is the King of Melonmark's family apparently being killed due to the failures of a previous S.H.I.E.L.D. hero, hence why he hates Naofumi, but they're all symptoms of the same constant that plagues this show, a lack of due care, planning and interest in fleshing out characters, themes and the wider world. I do think there is potential for a good story in S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero as is, with all of its elements included, but this version of it as it stands is an ill-tempered, ill-conceived, boring slog through frustration and piffiness. Now, it's not for me to tell people that they shouldn't enjoy this. If you did without taking the show's spiteful view on people in general, then that's fantastic, that's really good, and I'm glad for you. But for people who felt this show saw them and appreciated them for the ruts they perceive are actually in, from my point of view, you all deserve so much better than this trash. But anyways, that brings us to the end. 
Thank you all so much for listening and taking the time to hear me spontaneously combust over this fucking show. I would especially like to thank War Show's lovely patrons whose contributions have helped make this possible. If you'd like to see more of this kind of content, please feel free to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or YouTube, and even consider becoming a patron for as little as $2 per month. But until then, thank you once more, and in case you happen to be joining us at the end now for some strange reason, Shield Heroes a bag of wank, and good night.